mentioning there about um, you know not only playing bass guitar but also playing uh, double bass. So was that something yeah. that started earlier on, or did it did it come in sort of later? Well, I'll, t- I'll tell you what. And, and I, th- this, if you ask me what I am, I would say I'm a <laughs> professional musician, mm. right? Because I see some musicians who are fantastic musicians, but they're not very good professional musicians because we are hired by people. I'm not an artist. I'm a bass player. I'm a professional bass player. And um, so therefore I have to find the music personally, I have to find the music for myself uh, in the best way I can. Right. So, and I'm really good at that. I like uh, all music I play and I find the music in it and I'll play, I'll find the groove that is required and I'll be very, very satisfied if I walk out and I've provided that groove to the person who's booked me, that that's being a profession, professional musician. And it's also, it's what I do for money. I've never done anything. I can't do anything else. So you have to take care of, uh, you have to keep looking around to, just for opportunities to make money. I, I brought up two kids and had a mortgage and all that sort of So, and lived in London, not, not wasn't even, it wasn't cheap then. Never mind what it's like now. But um, so I always do, did that. And the, 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 uh, to answer your um, question about double bass, I was doing Jesus Christ Superstar um, with Ralphie. Ralph Salmon's great, fantastic gig, fantastic gig. You'd have loved to have come and sat in on that one, Charlie. You would have loved it. It was so great. Anyway, in the minute, I, I thought this is going to end this show. And actually, what was happening in the West End of London then was there were loads of loads of musicals and stuff, but you had to double on on the double bass. And I, I didn't, I never bothered, you know, I never bothered. And my friend, Simon Gardner, a trumpet player, uh, I knew he had a double bass that he'd inherited in 1980, a nice double bass. And I, I phoned him up, I said, Sire, have you still got that double bass? He said, yeah, it's up my loft covered in black plastic bin liners. And I said, well, if I have it, restored can i can i borrow it and um and i thought well i've never been to college and i've never had formal training in anything anyway i got this double bass took it to uh, roger dawson who, who restored it beautifully and it's this one here actually here we are uh uh and i started going to lessons and i thought well i'm gonna i'm gonna learn this learn this see what happens and there's a, there is a way there is a method of, of playing double bass you know the Simandl method Fred uh, mm. Simandl from eighteen mid eighteen hundreds or something uh, and there's a way of playing it and I found a teacher around the corner who I work with on sessions I'm I'm on bass guitar he's in this in this double bass section a lovely man Michael Lee and he said I said look I can read all the studies. He said, but what do you do with this huge expanse of black wood <laughs> every year? What do you do? And he went, fantastic. Because he was he was very, uh, very analytical, very, very a- anally retentive, very OCD about how to teach. And he got me playing. And, and I was mad for it, absolutely mad for it. Playing Arco, it was my hobby. Anyway, because I was mad for it, people found out that I was playing double bass. And... I got a call from Pete Murray, the keyboard player, and he said, what are you doing this afternoon? I said, well, nothing. He said, well, I've got a session at, at CTS. It, it was the old studios in Wembley. It's not there. Uh, and we, I need a bass player. You play double bass? And I went, well, yeah. He went, come on in. So I was in, and I've been frightened to death ever since. <laughs> and it was for Barbara Windsor with a big band, big band. Dave Arch was conducting, and I was sitting there, and then I'm in, then. I was in and I started doing gigs and I'd still keep studying. I mean, I practice that all the time and it's been really, really good to me being a doubler because and uh, the other fortuitous thing that happened when I started doing sessions on double bass was when Nora Jones became um, well known and everybody wanted a double bass on their record. You know, that kind of pop, smooth, just chilled, long notes in the groove and all that and, and they were booking jazz bass players who were fantastic jazz players 
but they'd first come in and they hated the music. Secondly, their their instrument buzzed and farted like because they never do sessions. And see, they're not particularly in tune. So I completely cleaned up because I can't play fast. <laughs> I can't play fast, but I get a great sound out of this bass, which I bought off of Simon eventually. He he, he sold it to me. Um and so I just put played pop double bass, which was very good for me. Really, really good for me. And you see it every now and again. I've done some amazing things on it you know of herbie hancock with vinnie and uh wayne short on double bass <laughs> god that was frightening but uh yeah so that's I, I as going back to what i said i'm a professional musician i make my money playing bass and my great friend phil todd saxophone player said steve adapt or die and to some extent, we all have done that, haven't we? I mean, you you know, I've seen I've seen years gone by drummers buying Simmons kit and going, what the is what is this? What you know, <laughs> buying the whole set of Simmons drums in order because they were adapting or dying. I mean, you you do it the same. Your drum kit is quite different from what it what people played 40 years ago, you know, because you 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 what you're required to do is to have that symbol and that thing and that, you know, sensibility and that knowledge of this and that. And if, if you don't adapt, you you will die, you know. I've, I've said this many, many times, but what you put into music, you get straight back out again. It's the most karmic way of living your life, as far as I'm concerned. Because, if you, you know, if you don't look after it, it won't, it will just go away from you, you know, I mean, and I, I'm fortunate now, I'm still enthusiastic after uh, nearly 50 years of doing it. Uh, I'm still just as enthusiastic about it. I, I, you know, I've, I've got CDs coming through the door today because I want to listen. I, I've been on Google or on Amazon and gone, oh, I fancy that. I quite fancy that, you know. Uh, so I'm still as enthusiastic about it. And it comes back to you. I mean, you know, people book me because, well, especially in the year, in the the time when I used to do jingles, uh, there used to be loads of jingles about. I used to rush around Soho doing them most days of the week, and they were invariably sound alike um, things, you know. And so I, 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 I sort of gained the knowledge of what makes that bass sound sound like that. Da, 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 da. And I'll, consequently, I've got a house full of bass guitars <laughs> that making different things, you know, making different sounds. But hey. As I say, adapt, adapt or die. Yeah, totally. And you know, having that stuff and also that sensibility is what keeps keeps the phone ringing. You know. Yeah, and yeah. Also, you know, having that want to listen to music and also, you know, I can see from the the the, the music stand behind you the want to yeah. practice as well. Which is oh god, yeah. We well, I mean, I'm upstairs. Have. This is my biggest bedroom in my house, and I've got the double bass in one music stand, and then I've got a, a music stand here for the the bass guitar studies that I play. So it's all on hand. And I, you know, I'll go for a pee and I stop on the way in and stop and stop <laughs> on the way out. And so it's kind of a good way to end it. We're just wondering if there's any, you've had some really good uh, bits of advice there that you've um, bestowed upon us. I wonder if there's any sort of other key things that you've been told throughout your career that you've uh, passed on to other people. Uh, oh, I don't know, really. I just try. I don't know. I mean, I've never taught music, taught, taught, give le given lessons, and in fact, these sort of things have really. I've done quite a few of these over the pandemic, you know, the podcasts and stuff like that, and it, it does make you think about about that. But I mean, I, you just, I don't know. I, I think you just have to serve your mu your music, your gift, and just keep keep on it, really, because. And it will take you wherever it takes you, wherever you deserve. I, I don't think, you know, even gigs I've lost or I've been blown out of or whatever, I've deserved everything, <laughs> all of it, you know, because I've, I've looked in the mirror, the, the difficult personal mirror and gone, well, yeah, of course. But you have to be happy with what you are as a person. You know, there's some people I was never going to get on with, Um in, in whatever situation and you just have to go well that, well that's because i don't agree with that or i'm not like that or i'm you know there's sort of try not to be too alpha male really i think that's the answer 
as a bass player, but you do have a un, untold power as a bass player, that's for sure. You know, I, I mean, I thought it was going to be an e it, people say oh, it's easy bass, and it? it's only got four strings or five, uh, and it, you know, it couldn't be further from the truth. You know, if you play a wrong note, everyone looks around and looks at you. Yeah. You know, because it, it, it's it's the bottom of the chord. You know, I mean, it's immense responsibility, but I do love it, and I, I mean, I see. I spoke to Ian Thomas this morning. We talked talk to each other, and uh, God, our friendship goes back so many years and in so many situations so many like silly little things and great things and and not so good things and and i love it i love the camaraderie and uh and may it may you all have your people that you grow up with like i have because it's it's still a joy an a absolute absolute joy you know must i must say to dip into a sort of different side of your your career now um you know you've done you've mentioned a bit about your west end work and i think the first yeah. time i heard you on the west end though you wouldn't have known it at the time it was when i came and saw beautiful okay yeah yeah um yeah. and you know what a show that was of you know the, the band yeah yeah it was, it was a, it was a good one you know quite quite the setup and um my mate Adam Dennis on that, and yeah, Adam, yeah, Adam Goldsmith as well, Neil yeah. yourself. That yeah, was an you amazing know, band, really, amazing, really amazing band. Yeah, and then obviously I've seen that sort of core of that band a few times since with with Cassidy and yeah, and, and doing yeah, nice little gigs. gigs. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I've got that album on on my shelf. Oh, there we go. Yes, yeah. still yeah, a, yeah. a great album to to listen to and i think you know there's a fair few different players who have done odd bits on that uh yeah on on that uh particular album but yeah sort of working in the west end's one thing but you've also done a lot of work with um orchestras so i have how, yeah how, how have you found that sort of going in as a rhythm section and adapting to oh yeah being under the I, stick of a conductor and well I, i'll go back to my formative years where i didn't go to college and i'd when I was 17, I used to dip in the Palladium Panto, uh, which was an incredible show. It had a full orchestra in the pit, about 25, 26, strings, harp. There were no synths then, 1977 this is. So uh, there was an upright piano, and it might have been an electric piano, full brass section. And I was, I'd never followed a conductor before in my life. And I, I was I was available. It was 12 shows a week from the beginning of December until the end of February. So it was a big chunk of work. And the bass player, there was never a, any debt policy. Um, you could be off what you took the gig. And the MD was a beautiful man called Gordon Rose, uh, who used to run the big band at Morley College for m many, many years. But he was the, the musical director of the Palladium. And I got put in and I went in there and after my first step, he came up to me and he said, if I didn't think you were going to be a really good player, I might not have you in here again. He said, but watch my stick, watch me. He said, learn. He said, and he said to me, learn the double bass. And I didn't, I didn't for another 20 years, but uh, I ended up being in there all the time. And I realized that it's another art playing with, because strings play there brass play there uh an orchestra plays all over the room and and they and the, the focus is on on this on the stick now going back to what we were saying about bass <laughs> the responsibility of the bass it's a nightmare because you are the bottom of the beat you are the bottom of the beat and i've had a few tussles uh, over the years i must confess but i've kind of got good at it I, hopefully I've got good at it and I'll tell you two stories the, the, I was I wanted to be better so when I was about 18 19 I used to drive to uh Maid of Owl studio BBC Maid of Owl that's just been sold um and in that studio in that building there were six studios studio one was the symphony orchestra studio two was the where the choirs were it's a very ambient room studio three was where the radio big band was 
Studio four and five were little tiny studios where broadcasts went on because uh, they used to broadcast things that went out really late at night, the trucker's hour and all they used to call it. Uh, and the BBC had to record a certain amount of live music in order to what give them needle time to play records. So it was, uh, and in, uh, Studio Six was the strings of the radio orchestra. So there were like hundreds of musicians every day every day and I used to drive down all the time uh Jack the bless his art the guy who used to hump all the the equipment around he'd let me in the back door and I'd just go from studio to studio watching listening learning I used to sit next to the bass player in the radio band which was not so much on the stick and I'd go and sit in the, the studio studio six with the radio orchestra which was light very light mi- pop music classical music with a huge string section and a little rhythm section set over to the and my great friend uh who used to take me all around studios a guy called kenny hollick who was a session drummer uh, i used to do a nightclub gig with him when i was 17 and he used to take me i used to drive to his house and he'd take me to studio and i'd sit there with a pair of cans on just stink drinking it all in and that's where i learned to learn or tried to learn about following a conductor where because uh, there'd be a different conductor there'd be two broadcasts a day different conductor and they'd have loads of music to do in, and you'd, you'd find and i'd sit next to a beautiful old bass player called bill brown and go what is 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 downbeat lads about the bottom of his tie where is where his tie is mm-hmm. So you'd learn, you'd learn the, you'd learn the bounce, you know. But I mean, I then I was thrust into it, and I, I it used to fox me like you wouldn't believe, and it still does sometimes because orchestras. If I say to, I, I remember doing some sessions, and Chris Lawrence and people, there's a whole bass section, they're all great chums, and I go, I'd go up because they can creep in, right? They're not in charge of the beat, really. You know what I mean? If you if the downbeat, if a bass guitar goes bong, you got no chance, have you? It's like bong and bong, 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 bong. So yeah. Anyway, I used to say, "Am I all right?" He went, "Oh, don't look at him. Don't look at him." You know, whatever. So I've done loads of things like that, and I, it's, there's uh, the first most amazing thing was Ralph Salmon said to me. He said, "You got to subdivide it, right? If there's a row going on, we're in charge of the time." So you've got to learn when when we're playing in time, the conductor's conducting to our time, really. And some of them are on the way back, and you can't look. You cannot look at them because it's so disconcerting. I've been at the Albert Hall where we're, we're, we're all of a mind. and We know who the conductor is, and it's... Uh, 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 and it's like... And it's a nightmare. It's an absolute nightmare. But what happens is eventually you work with these people and it's i'm afraid it's experience is that the, these people whoever the conductor is if they know me they know i'm looking at them and they know i want to work with them and and they will uh, more often than not say to the orchestra please it's the bottom of the beat and he's doing that because he knows that's where i'm going to play it right and then we're all going to get on and he knows that if it's going to if there's going to be a row i'm going to row with him i'm not taking the i am not disrespecting him i actually what i love doing it i love it when it all comes together i love sitting next to the double basses and playing their pizzicato time which is another whole thing i, I absolutely love love it because it's making this music being part of an orchestra it's it's a, absolutely it's magical and it's a joy and it's some you know whatever anyway the right the, the way i i i uh got the the rattles together was ralph said to me Ralph Sammy said, well, you've got to subdivide it. So that's that's how you do it. So it's one, two, three, four, one and two and three, and da 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 bong. And it all sounds beautiful. And that's that's what I do. That's how that's how I do it. It might it might not be the way other people do it, I don't know, but that's how I've got away with it this many years. Also, you got to, you got to tailor your sound. You can't have a Jacko middle sound and go beep 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 like that. You got the the it's the big fat warm beautiful comfy sofa note that all the strings 
sit on, you know, and you're not getting in the way of, you know, there's a, there's this chord going on, there's a whole sound going on, and you have to play tailor your bass sound to and your approach and and dynamic and and then orchestral players won't sneer at you, although you, they still do. They can't stand. They think you're going to be too loud. But I try not to be too loud within the orchestra. Try to make a, a nice sound. Have a have ears for the percussion who are like miles away, you know, and and try and make some music out of it because you actually are quite prevalent in them, even though you're only playing one note underneath the band it, it it can make people feel uncomfortable or comfortable and I, I try and make people feel comfortable on in orchestras you know yeah and I you know I know you've had a, a pretty long working relationship with Anne Dudley which of Anne course, Dudley beautiful Anne yeah, Dudley I love Anne which, Dudley uh, which led on to uh, doing Bill Bailey's remarkable <laughs> guide to the orchestra at the Albert Hall some years yeah. ago. <laughs> yes, we were a bit underused on that gig, apart from the fact when we had to go out and play the bells, which was hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. Yeah, it's good yeah. fun. Um, you know, highlights of that, you know, that the uh, the whole um, 70s cop show saga was just... Yes, a, very a well done. Beautiful piece of, uh, piece of writing and, yeah. you know... And it's it's one thing to be a musical comic, you know, like you know Bill on his solo shows or someone like yeah. Tim Minchin or yeah. Yeah. anyone like that. But when you're doing it with a full orchestra, yeah, and having to do the jokes completely to time, yeah, you know, what a what a a thing. And you know, it was great to see when you do those uh, the tuned cowbells, you know, you uh, Frank Ricotti and yeah. uh, uh, and Ralph just yeah. really getting into. You well, I, I, the thing was, we took Anne said to, phoned us up and said, "Look, I've got this gig with Bill Bailey and orchestra. I want you and Frank and and Ralph." I said, "Great!" So we turn up at John Henry's for the first rehearsal, and we don't know what we're going to be faced with. Bill's lovely, affable. Anne, I've worked with for many years. Did the Bull Monty film with her and all that. Loads of things with her. So that, it's all lovely. And he went. Listen, guys, he says, uh, I bought these Alpine bells. You fancy have a go on them? And we couldn't say no, because really there was nothing else to play. They were only little tiny bits. We weren't really called on for a, it, it was kind of easy to play. We went, yeah, all right. He said, um, so I'm 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 probably the least used to this sort of thing, because Frank, you know, through that sort of thing. Uh, and Ralph's classically trained percussionist so i'm a ringer really anyway and of course bill's there and and we get the first eight bars together and the, re the way we do it is we write our initial over the note in in the score right so we've got this how this has sacred piece of paper that went everywhere on tour when we went on tour that, because we were knackered without absolutely knackered without and we got the first eight bars together and i i thought Cost. I took up bass to sit out the back here. What the what the am I doing? What am I doing? But we were in then, and it was so much fun. And of course, we were suggesting things like we got all run round the run round and, and like be annoyed at him and all the rest of it. And the one at the Albert Halls, we we it's great. But when we went on tour, uh, Doug Harper did it on drums. And it got so out of order. It got so it, we 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 were hamming it up like you wouldn't believe, wouldn't believe, and running around the stage, <laughs> and, and hiding bells and all sorts. And it, it became it became this thing. And, and of course, we tried it. We played with different orchestras, and because it's a beautiful cello piece. <laughs> isn't it written as um and uh and of course we always used to sit up in front of the cello players and they were always in hysterics as they were uh, on the album all that yeah career highlight more people are like, talk to me about that than by bass well, playing That's <laughs> it's it's funny <laughs> um i can't remember who said it but uh it was a quote i heard a long time ago about how all comedians want to be musicians and all musicians want to be comedians. <laughs> well, I thoroughly, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And the thing was that I, 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 without getting too kind of a uh, um, uh, psychiatrist about it, I was, I was a very shy little boy, believe it or not. And actually, I, I, I went. It, it was until I started playing with my dad, and I'm not really a nervous person ever now. 
but I was a very kind of shy and nervous kid. And I remember when we were doing it, about to go on in t- White Tide's house, I was thinking if if little Steve Pierce could see see me doing this, it, I mean, I would probably die of fright. Actually, that's because it's. It, uh, but I really enjoyed it. It's. It, it was. It was a lot of fun, really. You know, like I mean, I don't mind having it up. And it's it was very well written sketch, wasn't it? It it, it worked. Yeah, it it, it yeah. was it was just you know just the idea of it of oh yeah we'll do we'll do the the swan from the carnival of yeah. the animals and yeah, yeah. we'll play it on tuned cowbells. <laughs> yeah, It'll be a laugh. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and yeah, as 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 you say, it came over brilliantly. As did that whole that whole thing. You know, as un- yeah, as yeah. you may have as you may have been on the <laughs> on the job. Yeah. But it was, no, it was good. It was great. it was lovely. I mean, as I say, it was a really nice project to do. And and well, we, we had things to, they had to be played right, but they weren't technically demanding. And then we we're in at the deep end. But yeah, Anne Dudley, she's abs- absolutely lovely. I've done lots of things, uh, orchestral things with her as well, with the concert or- BBC concert orchestra, where I work with quite a lot. You know. Yeah, and you know, I mean, sort of just to wrap us up. If there's you know of you know on. The, the podcast we like some uh some amusing amusing stories and uh <laughs> i'm sure with a, a career as long as yours you've had a few uh a few over the years of you know sort of what's the most sort of mad wacky you know crazy session that you've that you've done okay well i i, I... <laughs> uh well we got isabel if isabel griffiths phoned me and said um I've got this day at Abbey Road for this artist and um, I'm not quite sure where how this one's going to go. So I think you should charge quite a lot of money. We went, All right, okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, I've had a list of um, bass. In, I've had a list from her about the exact bass guitar she wants you to play. And I thought, okay. And she said, but there's quite a long list about all these things. So I said, uh, this whole thing, and everyone got one. It was me, Ian Thomas, John Paricelli, and Pete Murray on keyboards at Abbey Road. And um, anyway, I, I said, I don't know what this is about. A, a Lakeland five string. That's, I've got a Sadowski. It'll be fine. It'll all be fine. Anyway, we turn up, and it's this little girl who uh, comes from very rich parents, and she hardly speaks English. I think she's. I think she was from Portugal or Spain. I can't remember. Um, and she had a, just a list of lyrics. And so we've got this massive um, language barrier. No music, no demo. Uh, and she starts singing, and we're we're going right. Well, we better take this on. It, and it it, it became. Because she was getting cross with us as well, which is really brilliant. It's like we're doing our very best. I mean, you couldn't get more for more beautiful, and I'm including myself in this affable, caring, wanting to please, wanting to help, wanting to make your music. And she, I, I remember, I never, I never forget. She said to Yanto, "Here, here, round thing, play round thing." So he's hitting the symbol. No, no, round thing. And it's the tom. So the toms, <laughs> the tom and the symbol was both the round thing. So he was getting the needle over there, right? And in out of four of us, there'd be two of us seeing ourselves laughing like this, trying to not to laugh, and then be one of us with the ump. So it, and it would go round the four of us all day. Anyway, it was a, it was in Studio Three upstairs at Abbey Road, and we and we're sitting there and we're going. And we sort of cobbled this thing to get there together, and the door opens, and Sir George Martin walks in, right, with Princess Margaret's son, Viscount Lindley, right. And we go, and we go. This has got to be Captain Cameron. <laughs> so, this has got to be a spoof. It was so bizarre. Anyway, they, he just walked in because he's he's George Martin, and it's Abby Ray. Walks in. Oh, hello, gentlemen. And we go, hello, yeah, yeah, whatever. Completely interrupted this. Then we go back to it. And we, we this was like this. We did two, three days of it. And it just got more and more bizarre. And it became so legendary that it's I have actually got a CD of it. It, went, it made it to CD, but it went all around the music business about this bizarre session that we did. And 
we did it we did it in the end and it actually i heard it the other day it came on my i i my on my phone when i was out going out for a walk on select on uh shuffle songs and it I, and i remember every everything about it but it was bizarre it was the most bizarre and it wasn't a joke it wasn't a joke we did um shake rattle and roll she what she'd do is start singing and then we'd try and get a beat from it so she started she said you not shake rattle and roll another one of those tutti fruity or something little richard so she'd sing tutti fruity one really tutti fruity two other really and um what happened what we worked out was she sang it the same but terrible every time but exactly the same so what we got some kind of we got some kind of tempo out of it so what happened was she'd sing it and then we'd pete cobbin the engineer would move it so that it worked on the tempo because she'd go across the beat and the, the time but it was all the phrases were in time so we we went off for two hours they recorded her then we went back and it was all lovely and things so we, anyway so that that was that was pretty mad that was uh things are coming to me now <laughs> it's like, i mean you know some things are really funny to us but not maybe uh, if people say you should write a book and i'm thinking well i don't know whether people would be interested because what makes us laugh as musicians we've got a weird sense of it it's only you know and then when you're in the studio yeah there's kind of all that nervous energy going around and so things become funny that aren't really funny outside of the studio you know it's always great to hear some of these uh shall i uh, have you heard about my uh my session with george benson i haven't go on okay well it's on the youtube it's well worth looking. well it's not well worth looking at but you can see we, i was booked to mime uh, with george benson on loose women you know that show loose women so great brilliant we, he's singing live and playing a live guitar solo and me and uh, Bob Knight, the drummer, uh, Richard Taylor, keyboard player, we just turn up at uh, the old LWT place. Um, great. Uh, we're live to the nation at about, I don't know, quarter to 12. So 11 o'clock, we're in the pub across the road. Brilliant. Couple of pints. Go in, black suit on. Brilliant. George comes out. Uh, hey, guys. How are you doing? Hey, George, whatever. Turns up. He's got his amp. And his guitar, no tuner. So I lent him the tuner on me thing to whatever. So tears up. He we'd get one one go at it. One go, give me the night. It's live, live. So he's singing, and, and we're, I'm just miming away. And I noticed that he's stepped on his guitar lead and it's pulled out. And he's going like he's because he's playing as well. And he's going and he's gone like this. And I'm watching him on live TV. And I look, I look across at Bob Knight, who's the fixer. And I went, he goes, plug it in. And this is all on live television. Anyway, I managed to do this. It's brilliant. There's, there's like a held note in the middle of giving an eye. So I went, I mind, bong. And then I leaned, leaned, leaned down, picked up his lead and plugged it back in again for him to go and play the solo. And it's like, it absolutely, what was supposed to be just a simple mind, a couple of pints of Cronenberg, home you know he turns up and he turned around and he went you saved the day <laughs> George Benson. i mean it would have been nice to play live with him but that that's another you know mental mental thing and you can actually see me uh, it would be the one time the camera pans on on the band and it's me picking up his lead and plugging it in oh it's class yeah, yeah. absolutely class i mean <laughs> you know those are the sorts of stories that that you know, <laughs> you, you, you know, a great just to hear. You know, especially for, especially for the young blood like us. Well, may you have as uh, may you have a mirth as much of a mirth filled time as. Me. Oh, hey, uh, it's been, <laughs> Any, it's been, been great to have you on, and um, yeah, I think a real pleasure for for Ash and me to yeah, have man. someone like yourself come on and uh, and just have a nap there. So thank you for talking to us uh, once again, Steve, and uh, we'll see you next time on Groovecast. Yeah, man. See you later. See you later. Mm-hmm.